Well, thank you very much, Stephanie, for those warm welcome and those words, the, the five decades I could have done without. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm sure it's not five decades. It must be. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I'm absolutely delighted and very honored to be here uh, at the Clinton Library. Uh, it's my first time in Arkansas and my first time uh, in Little Rock, so I'm delighted to have that opportunity, but also because there are a couple of connections. I'm Irish. I'm wearing my green tie for St. Patrick's Week. Um, and of course, uh, we are deeply grateful to President Clinton and, and uh, Hillary Clinton for all they did for the peace process in Northern Ireland. And they have been great friends of the peace process, and, and so that's one connection. Another connection, which I just saw as we drove up, is that the Choctaw Line, which apparently used to bring the coal from Choctaw country down here, but the Choctaw uh, Indian nation uh, were a nation who donated money uh, in 1840s to help the Irish famine. And they, sent, they actually sent money uh, to Ireland, and the Irish Prime Minister, who's visiting the United States, as the Irish Prime Minister does, by the way, since something inno innovated uh, by, well, particularly by President Clinton, the idea of the Irish Prime Minister always coming on St. Patrick's Day. So the Irish Prime Minister is here in, in, um, uh, in the United States and will be, is already in D.C. Uh, but in fact, he went up to the Choctaw Indian nation and uh, uh, thanked them for what they had done and has, in, and has in, in instituted some scholarships for uh, Choctaw Indian uh, young people to go and study in Ireland. So uh, there's an, a, another connection there which I... I mentioned. So that's the publicity for Ireland, but uh, I, I, am, I am actually a European official, and I've, I've spent most of my, most of my five decades uh, working, working, working on, on European affairs, and I'm very happy to have the opportunity to talk tonight a little bit about the transatlantic relationship and some of the challenges, uh, but also the, the opportunities that we, we have in, in that relationship. I've been the ambassador of the European Union in Washington for just about three and a half years now, and I have to say that for much of my time, it seemed like I was very much on the defensive, uh, reacting to perceived crises and some real crises uh, in Europe. Uh, in 2015, it was the migration and refugee crisis. Um, that then I was dealing very much with uh, the, the trade negotiations in, in 2016, and, and also then the Euro crisis and the, the Greek crisis. And I was constantly being asked on the radio or on TV to explain, was the Euro going to break up? Was Europe going to break up? Uh, we had the, the horrible, shortly after I arrived, we had the first of a series of terrorist uh, attacks, uh, initially in France, then in Denmark, then in Belgium, then in Germany, and again in France. Uh, and again, people were sort of putting into question uh, the functioning of the European Union, uh, our ability to withstand all of this. And then, of course, we had uh, the uh, Brexit vote and the decision, regretful, but their decision of the United Kingdom to leave. So, you know, at times it really felt like I was always very defensive about the European Union and people were very skeptical. Um, I, I, I speak to you this evening, frankly, at a time of, of much greater optimism. Um, I say that with no sense of complacency or smugness, but I think uh, Europe is in a much better place in, in 2018 than we were in, in those past three years. A couple of reasons for optimism. Uh, the economy has turned a corner. We've actually had positive growth for nearly 16 quarters now in, in the European economy, uh, growth of two and a half, three percent, uh, even slightly higher than you've had in the United States. Uh, and some of our member states, Ireland, Portugal, uh, the, the countries who are in uh, the uh, bailout programs are actually posting even higher rates of, of growth. Uh, unemployment has come down from du double digits to single digits. Uh, investment is up, private sector investment is, 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 is flourishing, and the debt and fiscal situation of our member states is actually in very good shape. The, the, the hard decisions and some of the very tough decisions taken, you've witnessed the hardship, for example, in Greece, but I would say all of the countries who, who had to go through an austerity program have seen a lot of social suffering, a lot of change, a lot of difficult decisions, but they are now getting the benefit of those tough decisions, and there is a real sense of optimism. And when I'm in New York talking to uh, financiers, they're very optimistic uh, about the future of the European economy and the possibilities of, for investment uh, in, in Europe. So I think, again, I'm an economist, so I know that what goes up eventually comes down, but 
at least we're getting the benefit of, of a few years of, of economic uplift, which comes as a welcome relief after the, the doom and gloom of the, the last couple of years. I always like to say that you had a better crisis than we had. It may not have felt like that here in the United States, but you came out of it uh, more quickly. Uh, it took us longer to get our act together, but we've put in place, I think, many of the tools needed uh, to better respond to uh, economic crisis and downturns than was the case in the past, banking union, the European stability mechanism. So I, I think there were grounds for optimism there. On the, the trade side, which is very much a driver of uh, uh, economic progress in Europe, we have you know, an extremely ambitious trade agenda. We've concluded a comprehensive trade deal with uh, Canada last year. We're upgrading our trade deal with Mexico, which is a, an older free trade agreement from the early part of the, 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 this century. Uh, and we hope to finish those, those negotiations in the next few weeks, which means we will be have substantive and ambitious trade deals with two out of three of the NAFTA countries. Um, we are about to sign with, uh, China, with Japan uh, before the summer. Uh, uh, we already have concluded with Vietnam, with Singapore. We're in negotiations with Indonesia, the Philippines. Uh, we will open negotiations shortly with Australia, New Zealand. Uh, and we're close, but I don't know if we're there yet, uh, to uh, a, a, a very big deal with uh, Mercosur, which is the grouping of Brazil, Argentina, Uruguay, and Paraguay uh, uh, in Latin America. That goes along with trade deals we already have with Colombia, with, uh, the Central, with Central America. Uh, and with Peru. So if we complete the um, trade agenda we have by the end of next year, which is the end of the, the lifetime of this current commission, which is the executive of the European Union, the European Union will be at the center of the largest free trade network the world has ever seen. Uh, and this it really, in spite of the fact that we also have some difficulties occasionally explaining the benefits of trade to, to our population. And we need to be honest and realistic about trade. I think trade is a wealth creator. Uh, no country has achieved economic success without trading. But we have to be honest, it's a disruptor. Uh, and jobs are lost as well as gained. Uh, and regions lose jobs more than some regions and some sectors lose jobs more than other sectors. And that needs public policy to intervene to compensate for that, either to, particularly in terms of education and training or retraining, but also sometimes uh, investment needs to go into regions which have seen themselves suffer as a result of shifting trade patterns. And if you don't do that, then the, the, it will be felt that the gains of trade are spread unevenly, and then you will get a backlash with people saying, well, actually, this isn't such a good thing. And that's something I think we have invested quite heavily in, in, in Europe. Finally, we have, well, the third element I would mention uh, of the optimism in Europe, we've taken some very important decisions on increased defense cooperation within Europe. Uh, the context, the security context in Europe has changed for the worse in the last, uh, uh, I would say, 10 years, really since Russia first uh, um, had incursions into Georgia, followed by what you know what's happening in Ukraine. Uh, we've seen the deterioration of the situation in the Middle East, the, the tragedy the tragedy that is the civil war in Syria, which is probably the worst humanitarian crisis of, of a generation, uh, and the instability, that arc of instability down from Turkey through uh, Syria into uh, uh, North Africa. Uh, this creates a whole new security uh, situation for Europe. We are very much, uh, our geography <laughs> has us living in a dangerous neighborhood. Traditionally, uh, we have not spent vast sums on defense. And I, I opened a little parenthesis because I had a conversation this morning. Uh, uh, I, was, I, was at the, I was in Dallas and I had the honor of meeting uh, President Bush. Um, and uh, I, I, so I'm very bipartisan, I, I emphasize. Um, <laughs> But I was talk talking to someone who works at the, uh, the, Bu the, the Bush Library, or the, not, it was the center for, center, who was specialized in defense, and he was saying, you know, you Europeans are gonna spend more money on defense. And I said, yeah, we get that. But you need to understand our history, two world wars and the Holocaust, we weren't in a hurry to spend money on guns and, and armies. We were actually trying to say we don't need so many armies, because our armies were normally to protect us against each other. 
And since we had created a European Union where we were planning not to fight each other anymore, there wasn't a big market for saying we need to spend lots of money on our armies because basically when we did that in the past, it didn't end well. So there is a kind of psychological difference between us which sometimes gets a little lost here in the United States because they said, well, why are you Europeans spending more money on guns? Well, we actually did a lot of that and it didn't, it didn't end very happily. So, but in fact, we actually spend quite a lot of money on, on guns. We have you know, 1.4 million people in uniform uh, if you take our 28 member states and our def collective defense budgets are probably, when you add them up, they are the second largest defense budget in the world after the United States, ahead of China, ahead of Russia. But nobody thinks that we get the output from that uh, that you do or that the Chinese or that the Russians do. Uh, our defense expenditure is pretty inefficient. Uh, and, and on a good day, even with our 1.4 million people in uniform, we could maybe put 50, 60,000 fully equipped infantrymen or infantry, infantry soldiers uh, in the field, uh, fully, you know, fully equipped and supported. So we need to do better at uh, getting better value for our money uh, and, and cooperating more. Not every country needs an aircraft carrier, not every country needs uh, heavy lift facilities, not every country needs air-to-air -air refueling. So we're looking at working more closely together to pool and to share and to do more common investment in, in, in expensive military projects that individual countries could not undertake on, on their own. And this is a decision that was taken last year uh, to uh, increase our activity. I want to emphasize this is not in competition or distinct from NATO. NATO is at the core of uh, the security posture of most of our member states. I say this being Irish, we're not in NATO, we're neutral. An Irish Prime Minister famously said we're neutral, we're just not sure who we're neutral against. <laughs> and there are, six, there are six member states of the European Union which are not part of, of NATO, but even for those countries, we, we recognize that NATO is absolutely essential to the security uh, of, of, of Europe and the transatlantic relationship, and we want to work with NATO. What we are doing in European cooperation is not linked to territorial defense or co-belligerency of, of, of going to war if one of us is attacked. It is increasing the effectiveness and the efficiency of our military expenditure, and it's providing Europe with some capabil defense capabilities in case we wish to intervene in situations where NATO wouldn't want. Africa is an obvious case in point. There's no role for NATO in Africa, but there's quite an important role for us in peacekeeping or even peacemaking in certain African uh, theater contexts. And we already have European missions uh, who are fighting in Mali, uh, who've been training uh, uh, the African Union peacekeepers. Uh, so this is what this is about, and there's no there's no contradiction between doing more uh, on European cooperation in defense and being fully committed to NATO. At the end of the day, uh, the assets are the same. Uh, there is not going to be a European army because there's no European sovereign. So the armies will always be those of our member states. Uh, but if you improve the effectiveness of those member state military for the purposes of working together as Europeans, it's also a contribution to being better able to contribute to, to NATO. Uh, and so this is, I think, uh, an important development which represents the, the changing security environment in, in our region. I could go on, there are many other projects which we're, which we're working on and this commission will bring to fruition next year. A very important one is the digital single market. This is to uh, create uh, a truly integrated European market in the, in the digital uh, sphere. Uh, we have, you know, created a single market of 28 countries, soon to be 27, um, uh, with 500 million consumers. It's the largest economy, one of the largest economies in the world. Depending on how you calculate it, it's, it's you, the Chinese, or us, but frankly, we are by far the three largest economies in the world. Um, but we have not fully integrated our digital services, which were still siloed in national context, too many barriers. We're stripping away those because we understand that the distinction between what I would have called being the age I am after my five decades, um, <laughs> The, 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 the real world, the bricks and mortar economy versus the digital, and I know that some of the people will tell me there's no such distinction. I agree there isn't, and everything is being digitalized, but precisely because everything is being digitalized, we need all to, to get the same degree of integration of our economies in the digital sphere that we had in the, in the traditional sphere. We're working on energy, energy union, which is to create a, a real European 
integrated energy grid across all of, of the member states uh, for two reasons. One, to get better value for money out of our, our energy. I give you one example. The Iberian Peninsula, Spain and Portugal massively produces a surplus of renewable energy because they have a lot of sunshine. They can't export that because there's no connector between the Iberian Peninsula and the rest of the European uh, electricity grid. So we're building an, an interconnector under the Pyrenean mountain range to make that possible and then that will be able to supply other parts of Europe who are in, who are in search of uh, energy. We're also putting in place uh, LNG terminals to make it possible to import more LNG, hopefully from the United States, but other sources. All of this is designed to make us less dependent on Russian energy. It'll still be an important source, but we want to make sure that every European country has at least three separate sources of energy so that we are never at the mercy of the decision of any one country as to how they run their energy policy. And, and these are the projects which, are, which are, are moving ahead and I feel very optimistic about uh, the way that uh, the direction in which Europe is moving. Uh, but as I say, no, no complacency and no smugness because there are, as they would say in the world of economics, there are downsize, downside risks. And they're considerable. Um, the first one I've already touched on is the neighborhood. We live in a very volatile neighborhood. Uh, the change of policy in Russia under President Putin is a major challenge to Europe. I said it started with Georgia, but of course the annexation of Crimea was the first time that in Europe we had had a forcible change of uh, borders. Uh, even at the worst of the, at the height of the Cold War, we had agreed uh, in the Helsinki agreements of the 1970s that there would be no change in borders in Europe by force. This is because nearly every country in Europe has a border problem with some other country. <laughs> Just historically, you look at the map of Europe, uh, you can actually go on YouTube if you do it and you can sort of see one of these um, fast time-changing videos about the changes of borders in Europe and it's mind-boggling, you know, even a even hundred years and you see all the changes. So of course there's a legacy of many people feeling, well actually I was really part of that country. And if you open that Pandora's box, and you start saying, well, you know, I think I should have that piece of land back, you will, you will get nowhere. Uh, you will end in a dead end of conflict and fighting. So that's why we agreed, we just accept the borders as they are. They're probably not perfect, but any, any, anything else is chaos. But the annexation of Crimea by Russia saying, well, it was always Russian, and Mr. Khrushchev didn't know what he was doing when he had a few drinks and sort of gave, it, gave, it, gave, that, gave Crimea to Ukraine, that may be the explanation, but frankly, that's no reason to annex it. And, and this is really a, a major crisis in, in the, the, the confidence we have in the behavior of, of actors in the European region. So this is why uh, we are very concerned about the behavior of Russia and we need to uh, be very firm in our opposition to the policies of Mr. Putin. I mentioned Brexit. Um, this is another challenge. Uh, Talking about borders, one of the, for me as an Irishman, one of the worst consequences of Brexit is, of course, the challenge it now poses to the border in Northern Ireland. The peace process has many heroes, the Clintons certainly, uh, but uh, the Irish prime ministers, successive British prime ministers, and the leaders of Northern Ireland, the, the people on both sides, Ian Paisley, Gerry Adams, others, people who were fighting each other who finally found a way to uh, stop that and to try to live together. But at the core of it, joint membership by the U United Kingdom and Ireland of the European Union was what really laid the foundation for making it possible. Because you could give a guarantee to the Unionists of Northern Ireland that the border wouldn't change, back to my Helsinki point, that the, the border would remain, uh, they will remain part of the United Kingdom unless a majority of people in Northern Ireland decided differently. But you could say to the nationalists, actually, we're all in the EU together, you're living on one island, there is no border. Uh, you just walk, you can live and work uh, in the north and in the south, in the south and in the north. You can buy, you can go north, buy a shopping, you can go south. And, and so we squared the impossible circle uh, because both people, both sets of communities could have their own reality. Now this is put into question again, unfortunately, because now there's a question if the UK, and it will leave the, the, the European Union, suddenly you need to talk about putting back a border. 
And uh, this is something which was not really thought about in the Brexit vote and which now we're desperately trying to find out how, how this works or doesn't work. But that's only one of many challenges uh, of figuring out how we uh, unravel 45 years of British close integration in the economic, political, commercial and social fabric of the European Union. And we're finding every day new things which need to be solved, new, you know, whether it's aviation, whether it's uh, flows of um, fuel for nuclear reactors, uh, standards for pharmaceutical products, standards for food safety, which are all decided at European level, and suddenly what happens if the UK leaves? How are these things managed? The UK are discovering that they're probably going to have to recruit 30,000 new extra civil servants just to cope with the bureaucratic consequences of leaving the European Union and doing in the UK all the stuff that was done for them by the European Union. We're all very sorry they've decided to leave. I mean, this is their choice at the end of the day. Uh, but it is going to be very complicated. And uh, we are struggling to find a, a way forward that uh, enables us to still have a very good relationship with the UK, which is a partner, an ally, a friend, uh, but at the same time reflects the fact that they are no longer now a part of this European journey that, that we embarked upon. So this is going to pose certainly a challenge for the next, next year or two. Um, transatlantic relations, I think uh, they are very solid. But there's no doubt about it that the change of administration also brings some changes of policy and there are areas where we're, we're struggling to sort of find agreement. Um, we know that um, this administration has decided to withdraw from the Paris Climate Change Agreement. We were deeply disappointed by this because we felt that the Paris Agreement was a, a major achievement. America played an important role in that. We did too. We've been, we've been pushing this rock up that hill uh, even longer than you have. Uh, but we were delighted that we could finally get a global agreement where every country in the world bought in and said, this is a collective challenge for the planet. We need to do something about it. So we're deeply disappointed that this administration would then suddenly say that the United States is going to withdraw. I'm reassured that America Inc. is not withdrawing from the, from the agreement. When I travel around in cities and, and states, I see this country is deeply committed to addressing this issue. And uh, I think you will probably even meet your targets, even though you're not uh, a part of the, of the Paris Agreement. And I think that the business case for addressing uh, the challenge of moving to a more sustainable economy, the green economy, is irreversible. And I think business are very committed, cities are very committed, states are very committed. But still, the absence of the United States around the table of that Paris Agreement uh, is, is a great loss uh, for us, and, and we regret that. We've had a question mark thrown over the Iran nuclear deal, which we think was a very important uh, achievement of the international, uh, of international diplomacy, uh, and we are, we are very concerned. Uh, we're trying to figure out a way of working with the administration to see if we can work something out on that, uh, but it's, 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 it's not going to be simple. Um, the decision to move the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem at the end of the day, of course, it's the United States decision where it wants its embassy, but we feel this was to short circuit a peace process where the status of Jerusalem was to be the end part of the negotiation, not the start part of the negotiation, and we think this may make it more difficult to find a negotiated solution. And, of course, it will not have escaped your attention that we have a small matter of steel and aluminium tariffs, which <laughs> now separates us, where, again, I hope we can, we can find a way forward that doesn't involve us in, in tit-for-tat tariff imposition. But these are, these are some of the challenges that, that we, we have when you get a new administration and a change of policy, and we will, we will try to work our way through. But what I want to emphasize in terms of the transatlantic relationship is that nonetheless I think this is one of the most solid uh, partnerships uh, uh, to be found anywhere in the world. Uh, whether it's the economic and commercial ties, we are each other's biggest trading partners, each other's biggest investment partners, whether it's the security relationship which I mentioned through uh, NATO and through our common defense commitments, or whether it's the values agenda, our commitment to uh, human rights, to democracy, to the rule of law. And I think these, these relationships and ties will hold us together uh, even as we go forward with, with some, some challenges uh, in, in the areas I've mentioned. The fourth element I'd like to mention of 
sort of downside risk for Europe, is one perhaps we share in common with you. It's, it's a challenge of democracy. Um, I think that on both sides of the Atlantic, we have a certain sense of disillusion with the political system, with the ability of that system to respond to people's problems, and a sense of disillusionment with established parties. Now, we like to think in Europe that last year we sort of dodged the populist bullet because in the Netherlands, in France, and even in Germany, um, the populists did not win, win big and, and didn't even come to power. Uh, on the other hand, if you add up the cumulative votes for fringe parties or for extreme right-wing or extreme left-wing parties, it's still a very disturbing proportion of our electorate who are voting for these kinds of parties. So the, 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 the risk has not gone away. Uh, and I think that this sense of disillusionment with politics that leads people basically when they walk into the ballot box to sort of say, um, you know, I've got the established parties or none of the above. And they just kind of tick the none of the above. And it might be a right-wing party, it might be a left-wing party, it might be Brexit, it might be, you know, whatever. It's, it's almost as if I don't actually, I don't know what this is, but why don't we give it a try? And this is very worrying in our, in our democratic systems. And I, I think we're witnessing that in, in different parts of Europe, in different ways. We just had the Italian elections, uh, which was very much, I think, that phenomenon. And I think we have to uh, reflect, and I'm sure this uh, institute here is, is an important place where you can, you can think about it. Uh, what, what have we, what's gone wrong? What, what has gone wrong that people, that the, the established political parties are not able to offer solu credible solutions or solutions which people think are credible to the many problems they face in their, in their families, in their, their crime, uh, economy, uh, employment, future of their children, education systems, healthcare systems, all of these are under considerable strain in all our countries. The Europeans, we have, uh, I think, a better way of dealing with healthcare than you do, but our healthcare system is under challenge too. Uh, and we're struggling to fund it. We're struggling to fund our pension systems. We're str struggling to figure out uh, how we deal with education and training when we have uh, many uh, unemployed people and many unfilled job vacancies. How does that work? How have how we got ourselves into a situation where companies can't find the people they need for the, for the vacancies they have, and we have so many people who are unemployed? What, is, what has gone wrong in our education and training systems that there's this mismatch? So there are these many, many challenges, and I think we need to worry about why our systems are not delivering and the, the consequences of, of that continuing as we go forward. And from a European perspective, I mean, I think the European Union has been a fantastic project of peace, of freedom, and of, of prosperity. Uh, I say peace because we've had the longest period of peace on the European continent. You have to almost go back to Roman times to find it where you have 75 years of uninterrupted peace on the, on the European mainland. Um, Freedom, because we have been uh, a beacon for uh, the creation of, in this union of 28 countries, of democracies founded on democracy, human rights, the rule of law, the social market economy, and freedom of expression. And these are the values, by the way, which we've sort of taken from you. You took them from us when you were, f you kind of brought them on the Mayflower. <laughs> and planted them here because they didn't grow very well in the Europe of our, of our monarchies and our, 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 our religious disputes. Uh, you perfected them and then we kind of re-imported them, uh, a bit like we did with the, 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 the vineyards in California, you know, when we <laughs> but, and, and we share those values and we share, we share that, that vision of a society uh, which cherishes all its people and which tries to give a voice to everyone. Uh, and. Uh, the European Union has done that, particularly uh, in, if you look at what it did for Greece coming out of the, the, the kernels, 
Spain and Portugal coming out from the dictatorship of Franco and, and Salazar, and the Eastern European countries after the fall of the Berlin Wall. What they had in common was that the desire to join the European Union was a kind of magnetic north about how they transformed their countries from totalitarian dictatorships to liberal democracies. And that's a really good story of what the European Union has been able to achieve. And prosperity, because notwithstanding the crisis, no country in the European Union is less well off now than the day when all countries are considerably better off uh, than the day they joined the European Union. So in spite of all our occasional setbacks, the, the, the net contribution of the European Union to uh, the, 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 the economic well-being of Europe has been extremely positive. So that's a hugely important achievement. And I think we have to be willing to defend that. Uh, I like to quote uh, W.B. Yeats in the second, another, I end with an Irish reference, uh, in, in his poem, The Second Coming, where he talks about that the, the, the best lack all conviction and the worst are full of passionate intensity. And it seems to me that too much of the passion and the determination is on the side of those who want to tear things down, who want to destroy or, or radically change uh, what we have built so painstakingly over several hundred years of evolution from uh, the totalitarian or other systems we knew to the systems we know today, uh, which uh, offer opportunity and equality to all our citizens. And I think we need to bring some of the passion back into the defense of that model. Uh, we need to do that in Europe. The European Union is often the scapegoat or, the, or blamed for some of the problems, and I think we need to push back more. But I think we all need to do that to defend the values which underpin our system and to explain that it may have flaws, there may be problems, but our systems can also find solutions to those problems, and they will be better solutions than those proposed by people who want a radical change, which in my view, certainly in a European context, uh, will actually end up with making things far worse. So uh, that's what I'd like to say uh, to, by way of introduction. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, Okay, we have time for questions, so please raise your hands and we'll get the microphone to you. You have a question right up here, Bob. Right up here. Well, that's okay. We can take that one and then go. Thank you for that interesting talk. I enjoyed it. <laughs> I'm a bit concerned about the far-right movement in Europe and wondered if you could project uh, what the future might hold in that regard. And my second question is, with the upcoming... Uh, St. Patrick's Day holiday, do you have any American jokes? <laughs> I, I, no, I don't have any American jokes. <laughs> um, I'm also, I mean, I, I, I think it's clear from what I said that I, I think the rise of uh, the far right in, in Europe, uh, which needs to be relativized, I mean, it's not, it's not yet dramatic, but it's significant. Uh, and we should be worried about it. You should be worried about it. And there are some people, mistakenly, in the United States who have some sympathy for this. I, I sometimes meet people who say, well, you know, the problem with the EU is you're quashing national identity, and these people are right to want to assert their identity and the national... I say, well, it's fine. I don't think the EU does crush national identity. I've never felt anything other than Irish working for the European Union. Ireland has never had a higher international profile than since it joined the European Union. So nobody thinks that Ireland is no longer Ireland, it's now Europe. Everyone knows Ireland is Ireland. Everyone knows Portugal is Portugal. When you're in Latvia, you know you're in Latvia. You don't think you're in Italy. Uh, and, and we have, we, your motto is a pluribus unum. Our motto is unity and diversity. We are never going to homogenize the peoples of Europe. We don't want to do that. It will be a huge loss. Our diversity is our strength, our language, our culture, our differences. But it's a question of con containing those differences. Churchill said the Balkans ex produce more history than they can consume. We're a bit like that in Europe. We tend to you know, produce more history than we can consume if we're not careful. So, Americans should not be pushing us to overconsume our own history because we know that doesn't end well. It didn't end well in the past and it won't end well in, in the future. So I, I think I am concerned. We have to deal with it as Europeans. It's our problem. But I hope that also in friendship, our American friends don't 
misread what's happening and, and somehow think that some of these far-right parties might even be uh, potential political allies because I, I think that's getting it wrong. Okay, we have a question right up here. Here go, Bob. Well, no, right, no, right here, right here. No, right here. And then we'll call over there. Hi, welcome to Arkansas. We're really glad you're here. Um, I regret to find out that you've been at this for 50 years because you just actually got on my radar last year uh, when you wrote a letter to uh, Governor Asa Hutchinson in regarding, uh, regarding the executions um, and asked him to halt at least one of them. Would you comment on that? Well, the European Union um, believes very strongly that the death penalty is a mistake. Wrong, but also a mistake. Um, and it is a precondition for a country to join the European Union that they cannot be, they cannot use the death penalty. Now that's our view. Uh, we hold it very strongly. We believe in spreading that view uh, globally. We intervene uh, everywhere to try to persuade people of that view. Of course, we do so respectfully. I mean, at the end of the day, it is for every country to make up its mind. But we think this is a particularly important issue of human rights, uh, and so we do make that known here in the United States. We work a lot with groups who are campaigning for the abolition of the death penalty. Um, I must say some of the things I've done, some of the most amazing people I've met are people, exonerees, who've been sometimes a long time on death row and then who've been found not guilty. Uh, and those are the most amazing people because not one of them is bitter or, or vindictive. They're full of uh, hope for the future and uh, uh, remarkable. So yes, we, we do that. I want to emphasize we do it respectfully. I mean, at the end of the day, it's your decision and, and we know that. But that's our view and we feel that we have to, uh, just as people tell us sometimes you have to be willing to defend human rights in China, so I think it would be inconsistent if we didn't say, we say the same thing to the Chinese, by the way, who, who are also pretty good at executing people, and I think it would be pretty hypocritical if we didn't have the courage to say to you what we believe. But I emphasize at the end of the day it is of course your own decision. I just note that more and more states are actually setting aside the, the death penalty as a means because it's, it's very, it's not even a very good means of managing uh, criminal issues, but that's, we could have a long discussion about okay. that. Now we have one right there, yes. Um, you touched briefly on the Paris Climate Accord, and so um, I wanna hear from your perspective, um, what do you think the future is at this point with the absence of the United States? Um, and I understand it'll take us four years to completely withdraw from that, and, um, what do you think the impact could potentially be on the United States? And if we have a change in administration and a change in policy, do you see the United States being able to regain the position of leadership that they had um, concerning the Paris Climate Accord? Well, we haven't completely given up hope that this administration may evolve in its thinking. I mean, as you say, it will take a couple of years before the legal, the final legal process of exit uh, from the, the agreement kicks in. And uh, President Trump has said one or two things that, well, maybe we need to talk about it, uh, willing to look at it. So I haven't completely given up uh, that this administration, I'm, I'm not sure this administration has said its last word on the issue. I may be wrong, but that's what I, what I, what I think. Um, and more importantly, which is what I said in my remarks, I think all over America, everywhere I go, everyone is actually seized of the issue and doing something about it because it's just a practical problem for all of us. We have extreme weather, we have, uh, uh, everyone feels the consequences of this climate change. It is a huge security threat. I mean, the, the, the US military have analyzed it as the, probably the single greatest threat to America's national security is climate change. Not only for what it does to you internally, it does it to all, but what it'll do to less developed regions of the world. We're gonna have climate change migration. Uh, we're gonna have uh, shortages of water, shortages of food, uh, and this is gonna give rise to conflict and, 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 and huge security. So this is a, a massive problem. Uh, and I'm very encouraged with the fact that so many uh, cities and states uh, uh, and coalitions of mayors and governors are, are, are engaged. So I, you know, the, leaving the Paris Agreement in my view will not change the direction of, of where this country is going on, on this issue. It's a pity not to have the United States there because when you get the other countries, and remember we had great difficulty persuading China and India and other countries because they felt the West, us, polluted the hell out of the planet so that we could get rich. 
And then we decided it was a problem. We told them, hey, you may be poor, but you have to be very careful because you might pollute the planet. So they thought, well, that's not very fair. But they also now realize that they will suffer. Uh, independently of anything we do, uh, and that's the countries that will be most affected badly by climate change are actually some of the poorest. Uh, the Pacific Islands, there's an island, uh, a wheat disappears in the Pacific, sinks under the sea, and they have to move people to another island. Uh, the poorer regions of Africa, desertification in the African continent. It, so it's, it, it is a common problem, and India and China are now signed on to know they also have to do something about it. So I think that was the great achievement of the Paris Agreement, and I hope, and that's why it's a shame if America is not there and giving the leadership. Uh, as for if there's a change of administration, well, of course, you can always come back into it. I don't think anyone would say, no, no, you left, you can't come back. Um, and as I say, I, I, I hope maybe this administration will, will, will evolve. Yes, sir, you had your hand up right, right here, Freddie. Right here. He had his hand up for a while. Sir, I enjoyed your talk very much. I'm wondering, one problem you didn't mention was that of, of separatist movements, like the Catalans, the Scots, and so on. Is this... Do you just not see that as a major problem for Europe in the future? I, I, I don't think it's a major problem. Um, I think, you know, we had the example I, I quote is uh, Czechoslovakia, which was one country. They then decided they wanted to be two countries, so they negotiated a sort of uh, mutually agreed separation. Uh, and I think as long as these things are done in accordance with the rules and the constitution and democracy, it's fine. I mean, if Scotland, you know, the British government decided a vote in the House of Parliament in London to allow a referendum in Scotland to see if they wanted to be independent and to say that they would respect the result of that uh, referendum. The Scots in the end didn't vote for independence, but if they had voted for independence, it would have been, there would have been a constitutional uh, a way of, of, of making them independent. So I don't see that that is necessarily a bad thing, especially as common membership of the European Union means there still will be a lot of, you know, there'll still be a single market, they'll still be, they'll still be integrated. So it, 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 will, it will be really the things that are done at national level that devolve to, to, to Scotland or to any entity. The Catalan situation is trickier because the Spanish constitution doesn't allow for the secession of an autonomous region. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's where it gets difficult, because how do you deal with a situation where a region says, hey, we want to be independent, and they say, well, actually, there's no constitutional way in which you can do that. And that was the debate uh, in Spain at the moment. And the referendum, so-called, which was held, was frankly not a real referendum. It would never have passed the test of any international supervision. It was, a, at best, a kind of straw poll. 40% of people didn't vote. Uh, it's difficult to say that it was an accurate gauge. And if you look at the recent elections in, in Catalonia, a majority, a majority of members of the parliament, a small majority of members of the parliament are pro-independence, but the votes cast were in the majority in favor of parties um, uh, against independence. So it's very finely balanced. It's not as if there is a massive majority in Catalonia that says they want to be independent. So this is a very complex uh, political situation which the Spanish have to solve. And I think the Spanish government are trying to reach out and find a way. They've even hinted that they might be prepared in some circumstances to change the constitution to allow a referendum at a future point. So I, I don't think it's a huge problem uh, in Europe at the moment. Catalonia is one obvious example. But I, I think uh, it's really a question of how countries want to organize themselves. I give a final, another example. Uh, Belgium, the country I've, my adopted country, I've lived there for uh, 30, 30, 35 years. When I arrived, Belgium was a highly centralized country. It is now one of the most highly federalized countries. They actually have six, fed, six regional parliaments. Uh, so they have gone peacefully and, and through a political process from a very centralized to a highly devolved uh, and federalized structure. And, and this has happened naturally and, and uh, uh, in, a, in a peaceful and democratic way. And I, you know, I think that's, uh, you know, that's, that's, this is not a problem as long as it's done peacefully and, and with a, a kind of in accordance with the, the constitution and the democratic rules. 
Okay, let's, uh, yes, okay, let's see. Right here, question right up here, Bob. Mr. Sullivan, um, my question is, why is the, uh, it's clear that the greatest threat to the European Union is Russia. Why is the European Union so hesitant to give membership to countries with open border disputes such as Moldova, Georgia, and Ukraine, um, which would thereby sh shrink the Russian sphere of influence? It's not that we're reluctant to give anyone membership, but membership of the European Union is not like um, joining a tennis club. Uh, you may know that um, we, for many years we've been debating um, Turkish membership of the European Union. And I'm sure President Clinton won't mind until I tell this, this small anecdote. Uh, in 1999 I was in the Oval Office with Romano Prodi, the President of the European Commission, and President Clinton. And President Clinton was pushing to say, Europe, you really need to bring Turkey into the European Union. And President Prodi said, well, President, you know, it's kind of like you taking Mexico in as the 51st state. <laughs> and President Clinton went, I never thought of it that way. <laughs> and all his advisors immediately said, no, 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 it's not, no, no, that's, that's, that's completely wrong. He said, no, he's got a point. I want to think about this. <laughs> I mean, joining the European Union is a linking of destiny between the members. We have to be sure that we're on board in terms of commitment to democracy, to human rights, to a functioning economy. We have to be sure that there is not a massive divergence of economic level which will make the, the, the membership of that country deeply uncomfortable for them and for the rest of us. So you can't just say, oh, let's take Ukraine into the European Union. It'll take 25 years. Even if we said today we're taking, it would take 25 years. We gave a commitment to Turkey in 1963 and they're still not in for all the reasons you can imagine. It's 80 million people, it's a huge economy, it's a relatively poor economy. Uh, we have issues now of democracy, of human rights, of... It's a complicated process. So, of course, the countries of you, the, what we call the Eastern Partnership, Ukraine, uh, Moldova, Armenia, Georgia, they can aspire to membership. They are European countries, and our treaties say any European democracy can apply to join the European Union. But we also say you have to meet the criteria. And they're way, way off being able to meet the criteria. So talk of their joining the European Union today is simply unrealistic. And you can't make it a political tool and say, well, we'll take you in anyway, uh, because afterwards we will pay the price because it won't work. So that's, we have other arrangements, we have close uh, partnership, we have deep and comprehensive free trade agreements with those areas, uh, we work very closely with them, uh, we want a partnership with them, that's why we call it the Eastern Partnership. But really, to put the issue of membership on the table as though it's a magic bullet that suddenly solves all the problems, it wouldn't, not for them, not for the rest of us. So I think it's an issue that will undoubtedly come down the road as they develop, as they, as they become closer to uh, countries that are already in the European Union. So uh, that's, that's, the, that's the reason, and I think it would, it would be very counterproductive to imagine that a sort of blanket uh, commitment to take these countries into the European Union would, would solve anything at this point in time. We've got time for one more question, so let's, uh, let's go right here, Just right here, Freddie. I am so grateful to have been able to come hear you speak today. International relations has always been something I'm really passionate about. My question was about, um, you talked a lot about living in a uh, troubled neighborhood and how areas around Europe can be tumultuous at times. How do you feel that the rise of um, independence movements from stateless nations such as the Kurds and the Palestinians might affect security for the European Union? Well, I mean, I think um, conflict in, in the region is, is, a, is a huge source of instability. I mean, you mentioned the Palestinian issue, and again, President Clinton uh, did tremendous work to try and address that issue. Uh, we've believed always that that's an issue that needs to be resolved, not just in the interests of Israel and the interests of the Palestinian people, but also in the interests of stability in the region. Um, it has proved very elusive, uh, and I think, you know, with the consequences we, we see. Um, the instability in Syria 
and the now the the the, the relation the, the issue with the Kurds. Of course, this is all part of instability in the region, and what we want to see is more stability in the region. I mean, at the end of the day. Uh, the countries of the region have to figure out how they're going to manage their own their own relations, uh, and it's not up to us to tell them how to do that. Our whole policy objective is designed, for example, in Syria, the objective is to have peace, firstly, because this is a the, the civil war is is a, is an absolute tragedy. Secondly, to get the the representatives of the Syrian people, all the Syrian people, around a table, which we're trying to do in Geneva, to figure out what they want for the future of their country. How, how, do, how do they want to manage their, their country? What kind of country do they want? To, and do they want a single country? Or do they, do they want to divide themselves into several countries? Whatever, whatever kind of works for them, I think the international community will support. And then to start a massive program of reconstruction, because the country is devastated. So it's not that any one problem is, is, is a source of instability, it's that the whole region is in flux. Uh, and you have unhelpful actors, you have Iran uh, uh, you know, not, being, not being helpful in, in the way that they're behaving. The whole region was destabilized by the Iraq, the invasion of Iraq. I mean, that, that kind of started the unraveling. Uh, and we're dealing with the consequences of that, uh, and we're going to have to deal with it for some time to come. So I, I don't think it's a question, as I say, of any one one issue in the region. There, there are many different complicated issues in the region. Uh, and our concern, working also with the United States and the rest of the international community, particularly the United Nations, is to try and help stabilize the situation, uh, allow people to have democratic control of their own countries and to take their own decisions and to provide support for that, but also support for their economic development. Because I do think uh, a lot of the problems come from uneven economic development and, and that breeds extremism and breeds terrorism. Uh, and, and that is ultimately the cause when you look at the situation in Gaza. Uh, it is not surprising that people who grew up there grow up bitter and resentful and many of them willing to join terrorist organizations because it's, it's such a, a, an economic and social catastrophe. Uh, and so unless we can start addressing these root causes, we will still have this instability for, for many years to come. But it's, it's a, I don't underestimate this, the size of the challenge and, and uh, we're, we're willing to, to, to contribute. We're the largest donor of development assistance uh, in the world. We're the largest donor of humanitarian assistance. We were the largest donor of humanitarian assistance uh, to the Syria crisis. But alone, even though we're a wealthy continent, we, we can't do it alone. We need others. The United States is also a generous donor, particularly on the humanitarian side. Uh, but we need others. For example, some of the Gulf states, in my view, do not, did not make the financial contribution to the Syria refugee crisis that they could have, particularly the humanitarian crisis. So that's, it's, it's, going to be a, it's going to be a troubled neighborhood for some time to come, I'm afraid. Mr. Ambassador, we want to thank you for your five decades of service. <laughs> And we thank you, uh, and we thank you very much uh, for this conversation today, for the very enlightening comments that you made, uh, and for being such a great friend of our country. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. Thank you.